Welcome to the Unfiltered Friends podcast, where we humanize your favorite creators through their personal stories and then learn something from them. I hope you feel inspired by today's guest. And if you do, share it with someone who needs it. So without further ado, here is Unfiltered Friends. What is up, Daily Crew? I thought I would at least start the first video where I start doing my podcast on here with the intro that you guys are used to. The one that I did for so many years, and I am so grateful for all of the conversations that we've had and the lessons we've learned and the adventures. But it was time for me to kind of move in a different direction. And I do miss creating content on here. I do miss having great conversations on here, but I needed to do it in a way that aligned with who I've become. This first episode of my podcast, which is Unfiltered Friends, is with my dad. I've always had a very different idea of what it means to be masculine. And my dad had a really rough childhood. A lot of the ways that I think about masculinity come from my dad and in combination with my mom, and it's it's healthy. But he didn't have that healthy example. So I thought I would do an episode where I sat down and I talked with my, my dad and learned, how did you become the man that you became to teach me how to be the man that I have become? It's a fantastic conversation. I'm going to start uploading the full video conversations on here, little shorts too, so that if you only want bite-sized pieces of it, I am just really excited to start this journey. And I understand if you guys aren't down for it, it's a major departure for what I was doing on here, but it is going to be the direction I'm going moving forward. So if you've always been here, thank you for being here. If you're going, thank you for being here for that brief period of time. And without further ado, here is the first video episode of unfiltered friends so uh, i couldn't think of like a better person to have a first in-person podcast with than my dad you know got got you here so might as well um i've noticed that throughout the course of my life the way that i view masculinity uh tends to not fall in the common category um i think that's not always other people's fault that they end up kind of stuck in that because you you know what you're taught, but you also have control over where you go. But ultimately, I'm able to do that because I had an example to follow and not everybody has that. So I guess the purpose of this conversation, I want to find out like what it was like for you, you know, what examples you had and how you got to your idea of how to guide me to be a good man because it's really hard doing what, I mean, you've, you've witnessed how hard it can be to be in the public eye as, as much as I am, you know? And I know a lot of times you wish you could save me from it, but I think this is the battle that I have to go through if I'm going to be in this space. And I, I like being in this space. It is a bit of a sink or swim situation. If you save, if I save you or anyone saves you, then you'll never swim. So let's, um, I mean, let's go back to the beginning Back to 1975 when you were born, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, tell me how masculinity was modeled to you when you were a kid, because you had your uh, your biological father, and then you had a stepfather, and then you had a teacher, and I'm sure there was any grandma. Do you can you bring yourself back to how? masculinity was modeled to you from your father? Well, I have no memories of my father. Right? We, uh, he left the scene when I was three. So what happened there? Well, um, my uh, mother and my father were both, you know, happily married, but he was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And he was, my, by all reports, he was a super intelligent guy, you know, could do math in his head while reading the newspaper, stuff like that. Sounds familiar. Um, very charismatic. He was a car salesman, which I guess it goes with that. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the alcohol just led him to make a lot of self-sabotaging things and eventually got to the point where she was tired of bailing him out or rescuing him and things like that. So... Um, so this is about when I was about two and a half or three. Um, Do you have memories of her during that time and how she coped with things? Or were no, you too young? No, I was too young. 
Or do you feel like also, because it seems like grandma really sheltered you from a lot of things or tried to. I think that's true. I mean, there was a lot of drama going on in her life with her own family. She was estranged from her family. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I didn't really begin to understand, you know, her earlier life until um, probably the last five years before she passed. Um, when little things started to leak out, mostly through my older brother, mm. David, David, who was 12 years older. Mm. So David was really kind of the masculine figure that I had mm. uh, because uh, he and and mother were a, a team. And they were and they they fully embrace that they so to certain to for the most part uh, i think he was really my father figure within the early years even in the presence of my stepfather did you have you ever had have you ever told him that no not really why not because i don't think i realized it until now no (laughs) that's a beautiful beautiful thing about these conversations like all these like little nuggets come out that you just never really recognized so what version what what kind of example did he set for you back in that time that you can remember well he was he was very artistic and very tolerant um was a fierce defender of mom so the memories i have particularly like when you're in Estes park and stuff like that was um him going toe to toe with larry just before he went into the navy maybe larry was my stepfather um and there was violence involved and so I'm, we're out in a cabin in the, in the woods, so to speak, and no place to go. Um, and, you know, I saw him, uh, you know, chest up in front of him at 17, 18 years old mm-hmm. and, and say, not, it's not happening here. And that, that kind of burned an image of, of uh, defending your family and stuff like that into my brain. When he went into the Navy, I really felt lost because he was he was your so before we get into his story let's rewind so you don't have a whole lot of information about your 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 dad a biological dad no so how how has that affected you like i have you and i have this guidance system and i have this like i'm very much like you in so many ways how i guess you had david in a way but he's still your brother right so you know the uh I think my makeup is actually a composite of everyone I passed. So, you know, Larry um, rescued my mom and that, and we kind of get the sense of that. Um, I think they actually did love each other. Um, but he, he had a, his own history. And for some, I think that history was starting to catch up with him. I don't know whether it was a former marriage or something like that. But one of the consequences of that is that it seemed like we moved abruptly a lot. Hmm. And looking back and talking to, to my older brother, it seemed like he was running from something. I never knew what that was. Um, he liked to kind of model himself as, you know, almost like a a mob like guy. You know. So how did he enter your life? Let's get back to let's go to the beginning. How like how old are you when Larry shows up? Three. So it was an almost immediate transition from your biological father to this. As in, as in many many cases, up until we were in, in high school, it was abrupt. You yeah, know, it just one day we were at home, and the next day we were in the back of a car. Hmm. And I suppose you're too young to even ask why. You just kind of no. We went. kind of slept in the back of the car and rolled with the. And rolled with the David floor. didn't ask, or David knew and didn't tra- and didn't answer. Well, he, we didn't ask him, and what he knew, I imagine he knew most of it. David never, never really talked about it. And I think that's because mom never really talked about it. And then they were pretty tight as a team. So mm-hmm. if we didn't need to know and it wasn't going to benefit us in some fashion, no, we, did, we didn't know. So in the beginning, when Larry first enters, was it immediately because he was an alcoholic as well? He became alcoholic. I think in, in the early days, it just seemed like we were moving from job to job to job. And I didn't get the impression of him being particularly uh, abusive or anything like that. You know, we were, it just is what it was. Um, but we never seemed to stay in any place very long. And, um, 
And the one thing I, one of the positive things, and I still view it as a positive thing, is that we did everything. We culled green beans in Oregon. We did roofs in Nebraska. Uh, it, you know, you've seen the pic- map we did where we tried to figure out why we were in that town. Mm-hmm. So uh, we modeled our house in Effingham. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so he was he was ex- very handy and basically had the a- a- attitude that there wasn't anything he couldn't fix. Uh, and particularly since we were with him, uh, we, we learned to do those things as well. So most of my handyman skills came from him. And the idea that there was no job that was too good for you, mm. you know, so... Because you got your first job at 12, right? And this wasn't like, uh, I'm getting myself some candy money. This is, we need to eat. That's true. Um, I think for up until I was about, actually until I left home, most of the money I earned as at jobs went to the household. Mm-hmm. They turned it over to mom. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, my the story of my first job was it was in Effingham. Mm. And he said, well, we need to go get a job. Cause we, and so I walked down the street to a, um, it was a motel. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And But I had grown up through a lot of different schools and been a lot of different places. And so one of those things it does, it makes you fearless in new situations. So I walked up to the manager and I saw a person coming out of it and and I, I use this as a meme for my life. I go, I don't know what that person is doing, but I bet you two days I can do it better. And he goes, okay. They well, must not have liked that employee very much to just to just look at a random 12 year old and be like, yeah, I mean, if you can do it better, I'll just give you the job. So, you know, I was cleaning rooms like that. But yeah, it, it turns out that she actually was better than I was. Oh, was she? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he liked the chutzpah so much. He put me to work on the switchboard in the office at oh. answering answering calls. So I had that job for the summer and doing, you know, refilling pop machines and stuff like that. But it was that attitude that I can do anything mm. uh, that uh, gave, you know, his, whoa, mm. you know, balls on that guy. Yeah. Uh, and that has basically been my approach to anything new. Uh, you know, even as a professional, I would say, if you can give uh, me the same chance to give that guy, I can do a better job. And and the, the trick with that is you actually do have to do a better job um, or find other values. So um, but that's how I got my first job was basically um, walking into a place and saying, you know, um, take me on. Um, I think after Effingham, at that point, we were working as caddies at the uh, um, Urbana uh, Champagne Country Club. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is why we were living in Urbana, which was, you know, um, so that was a 40-minute uh, walk or a 50-minute bike ride. Mm-hmm. I got my first bike because of that. Um, and then when we got to be older, we actually painted apartments in the apartment complex that my mom and stepdad were managing. And that actually brought in pretty good money because she paid us like anyone else. But still, most of the time it was going to support the household. In the beginning, was it good between you guys or was it pretty immediate where you could sense that there was something off about your interactions with Larry? I would say it took a couple of years. You know, I remember the first time I started seeing the dark, darker side of him, or at least I recognized the darker side was when, again, we were in Colorado, Estes. Mm-hmm. And um, so at that point, I was just in first grade. So young for that. But so it's, was, what I've noticed about, like, from being, I was a step parent for a while and they were pretty young is like kids. I don't know if it's different now than it was back then, but kids see what's going on. It affects them. They sponge it. Well, it does. And so the the, the thing we noticed about him was that if you uh, showed weakness or anything like that, um, that uh, it would it would draw him out. And so the funny story I tell is about the difference between how people respond when they're in pain. Mm-hmm. So when I when I um, married uh, uh, Kathy, your mother, um, she would I'd hear "ow" and I would come flying down the stairs to see what was bleeding. That's how I react now. 
Right. I take Al very seriously. <laughs> and and she go, I, I stub my toe or I bang my finger or something. And they go, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, in our case, um, if you said Al, it brought you know it brought uh, annoyance or uh, you know uh, deprecation. You know, it, it, he would he would essentially attack. I mean, it's like it's like blood in the water. He would attack if right. someone complained in any way, shape, or form. Well, he would get excited, and then and then he would start yelling and stuff like that. So very quickly, we learned that if unless you're bleeding, uh, you don't make any sound. So that, that had to have been a really tense environment to be in. It became that way. It, be, it certainly became that way. So I would say, from the time I was like twelve. Um, I see. What is sixth grade now? Uh, sixth grade would be like yeah, twelve. Uh, from about twelve to the point when I left home, about when I was about fifteen, six, I was sixteen. So about so there was a large part of the time where basically we would go to our rooms and hide out mm -hmm. because we didn't want to in, in, uh, start anything. So working was a way to escape that, and school was a way to escape that. But there was, I mean, there were times where you you couldn't escape it. Yeah. Well, hold on. Before we get there, in your adult vision now, have you have you spent much time thinking about why Larry acted the way that he did or just kind of moved on? Well, for the most part, I moved on. But I think um, I would say in the sort of the middle years of that uh, time, say from, you know, age six to about age 10 or so, um, I think you. I think we were literally legitimately running from something. I, we went from school. We went from school to school every twice a year. Twice a year. Yeah, thirteen schools and before high school. That's crazy. Um, they did get a job where they were managing apartment complexes as troubleshooters, and so they grandma and and right. Larry. And so grandma would handle the would take care of the books, get them up to snuff, and Larry managed the maintenance. And when they got up to snuff, they get transferred to another uh, apartment complex in the same company. And so that was that was actually not a bad time. That was, we were in California, Orange County, Anaheim, that, that type of area. And um, uh, so there was there that was actually a fairly stable time from a personality standpoint. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I wasn't conscious of a lot of strife. Uh, David was in the military at that point. Um, David kind of just fled. It seems that it seems that he just it was time for him to go. Right, and I think that was one of Mom's great gifts to both David and myself and my brother is that when things got to the point where it was going to escalate to violence, she found a place for them to go. So, in the case of David, when he when he chested up to uh, uh, Larry. Um, uh, she recommended that he go to the Navy or <laughs> go somewhere. Grandma's recommendations were always recommendations. <laughs> yeah. And when I had my event like that, which involved an argument over whether or not I had locked up my bicycle. Yeah. Uh, well, just tell a story. Well, we, we lived in an apartment complex and then we rode our bikes back from the job. Uh, we were at the caddying job. And I put it downstairs. I had forgotten to lock it up. And he got mad because it wasn't locked up. And he dragged me downstairs. And and in the process of that, he hit me with the chain. Wow. And I was about 15, almost 16 at the time. I took it away from him and hit him back. Where'd you hit him? Do you remember? Yeah, it just crossed the body. I don't... It, you were just defending yourself. Yeah, and... and you had never defended yourself physically previous to that? No, just verbally or something like that. Uh, I mean, we've been on the other side of doors when he's kicked it in, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it was. So at that point, I had had enough. And um, mom found a friend that she knew, which was Paul Kohler, mm. who was a minister in the area, and asked if he would take me in. Mm. That's how I ended up there. So last. So who who was Paul to you? He he actually was the chemistry teacher at my high school, but he was also a uh, 
Episcopalian pastor or minister mm. or something like that. I may have the denomination wrong, but he already had the, uh, he already was you know, fostering uh, kids my age. Mm. Uh, and so I had a, I had a buddy with him, um, Bill Kirkendall. Anyway, so it was one of those things where within a week I was out of the house because once you cross that line, cross that line, then it escalates. And that was true with Larry. He said, then he says, Oh, okay. You know, this seems is, like he had an obsession with control. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know I've listened to some of your, your stories about, uh, in narcissists and stuff like that. And one of the things they do is provide financial control. And for the many years, it, you know, we were kind of, you know, just barely hanging on and he was the primary breadwinner. And if you're in a very unstable environment, you have to cling to that. Yeah. It wasn't until we got stable and that's what happened in Champaign that we got to the a point where mom built her own network of friends, her own, her own, had began to understand uh, how to, where, how to save money quietly. Um, got a few lawyers involved, things like that. But mm. that took time. So describe describe those first moments when you're with Paul, who is now essentially a, a father figure to you. Was there an adjustment period there where you were used to a certain way of being and it was different there, or was it an easy adaptation? All right, that's very curious. I often thought about it. I've been thinking about him lately. Uh, um, I think since retirement, you get a little reflective and Paul was one of those guys that, um, he set the, what you would call boundaries very early. Hmm. Here, here's the rules of the house structure. He gave a lot of structure, but he was very benevolent in the way he did that. Hmm. Um, did you struggle with trusting men at that stage of your life, considering your history? No. Why do you think that that didn't happen for you, considering both father figures in your life were either like self-destructive or abusive or neglectful? Because the the father figures I had mm. were not that way. So my father figures go back to like, uh, let's see, fourth grade. We were in California. I walked into school for the first time and I saw that. You know, I'm 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 one of those guys who, you know, your mom is brought in every other week, going, you know, what are you going to do? When are you going to get this guy in order? Because it basically, uh, if I liked it, everything was fine. If I didn't like it, I, I acted up. Mm -hmm. Was basically pretty bored. Um, and some teachers tolerated it. You know, I got moved around a lot, but mom got was called in a lot in the first four years of school. What would you do? So, you know, in Effingham, for example, you know, I've grown up in the space, space race time in California, math and science were, oh, yeah. were, you know, top of shop there. Then you go to Effingham mm -hmm. and not a whole lot going on there, not a whole lot going on there. And the, uh, um, the math teacher there, there, his big challenge for people was to be able to do, uh, regular mathematics in your head. And so he, he new guy comes in, he challenges, and he goes, okay, so let's see how good you are. He goes, you know, three times nine minus six plus five. And I give him the answer without even blinking. And he goes, huh? Mm -hmm. Everyone else is kind of looking around. He says, let's try a different. He started multiplying things. And, and that was, you know, that was, that was like, so what? Um, so my brother and I were both very good at school. And, and that was where we, that was our safe zone. Do you think that because, you know, now that I'm listening to to the stories, do you think that you were both were just particularly intelligent or do you think part of it was an was kind of your understanding that this was going to be your way of escaping the situations you would experience growing up? Like the importance of being able to be because you watched your mother um, be dependent on someone who was abusive to her so do you think that maybe an aspect of you guys focusing on school is you didn't want that for yourselves 
Well, I think part of it is, was the mom. She was very focused on education. Mm. Um, she was very smart herself. Uh, and so uh, she was she was no nonsense when it came to homework and things like that. But I think the bigger thing was is that it, it doesn't take long for you to realize that we, in that environment you're safer. Yeah, school environment. Mm-hmm. Mm. And so uh, there you were safe. And if you went home and, and went into your room or quiet and worked on your homework, you were safe. And so when you focus on something, you get good at it. I mean, we didn't have a lot of extracurricular activities until later in high school. Mm. Uh, for me, it was theater, uh, technical theater. And, and for Bob, it was more science stuff. So, so that was our, uh, that was our thing we could do that wouldn't cause any disturbance. So you got, so you spent a lot of time focusing on it. The other part was we got very good at learning the ropes in new places. So usually you're a little behind when you, when you show in, show up and you have to catch up. And that requires that you uh, study hard and stuff like that. So we got a lot of practice at that. So we got good at that. Uh, the story in Effingham was is that uh, we were really the best people in the room. But the pe- best people in the room before uh, was the head cheerleader. Hmm. So... I can remember several times where we get slammed into lockers and say, you know, you got to be dumber mm. by her boyfriends or her, the football team or something like that. And I lived, I'd lived in the ghetto in Denver, as you know. Yeah. And I looked at that and I go, well, unless you have a knife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that, it wasn't that I was going to beat them up. They were bigger than I was, but most people respond don't respond uh, positively to crazy. And the thing we learned was is that if someone comes at you, you don't have to. You have to out talk them, outrun them, um, and at the last resort, you you hit them where it hurts, and then you run. <laughs> Who taught you that? Life. Hmm. We, you know, you we've been in a number of schools that were really rough. You know, where whites are a minority. Uh, um, you know, downtown Denver at that time was not safe, not safe. Walking home was a fun thing. Was it interesting walking through downtown Denver for you? Did it bring up anything or was it, is it so different that you can't really like place it? Well, the biggest thing was that I, you walk through it now and you go, Oh, you didn't have the fear. Mm, this time. This time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think there were places where, uh, we walked yesterday that brought back some of that. That's, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. yeah. I was bringing you through, I live where you did. Yeah. So, you know, the, the homeless people in the street, a couple, saw a couple of people doing, uh, something interesting with, uh, things in foil. Yeah. That and, was, de- they were definitely doing drugs just straight up on yeah. the sidewalk. Yeah. So, so the thing, the thing I learned back in those days was be situationally aware to keep so do social distancing so that you can run if you have to and so that that i found that raised my hackles a little bit you would uh, so i mean larry was a part of your life for a while the way that larry would conduct himself was through violence and control whatever whatever that looked like why didn't you model that at all well, like I said, one is we tried to be out of that, away from him as much as we could. The biggest, biggest thing at home was we had mom. So it seems like, it seems like grandma kept you aware without maybe involving you. She's like, this is not right. Maybe. Um, here's how you protect yourself. Cause she was also a victim of it while she was trying to make sure you guys were okay. She was, um, I mean, it wasn't like the violence was every day. It was very sporadic, and you kind of you could kind of see a build up to it. It's usually when something didn't go right in the business or something. Or what we learned, what I learned af- much at, well, after the fact is that the last three or four years he was, uh, we were with him. Uh, he had he had um, stomach cancer. Because hmm. one of the things that used to get him off, get get him going was if we drank the milk in the refrigerator. And he would just absolutely fly off. And we'd, I mean, that, that actually brought real violence. And we got milk. 
But what we realized is that that was, he didn't like to, like to go to the doctors and stuff like that. So he was sort of treating his stomach cancer with, with that. With milk? Milk and alcohol and I don't know if he's doing anything else. But um, he wa- he died, you know, probably a year after we left from cancer. So, okay, I want to talk about grandma's escape because I'm like, it's so funny. I pretty much knew nothing. So, so let's, let's take a pause here because okay. you asked a question. I want to answer it. Okay. So why didn't I model Larry? Cause I think, I mean, the reason I asked that is because as men, it, it, there's a lot of pressure to, uh, or a lot of expectation of responding to either disrespect or advancements upon you with violence. It's like, you know, if you can't handle it, you're a bitch. And that really is a way that people play on men's masculinity. And it, it and the fact that you were able to look at that differently, uh, like that's impressive, but also not what you grew up watching. Let me go back to the story in fourth grade. Okay. And this is really the, the I would classify as a turning point. Mm-hmm. A real turning point. So uh, I'm used to walking in and trying to figure out. It's kind of like the prison bus scene. Uh, you walk in, you're new, and you want to see who the who the person you're going to have to compete with. Is. That mm-hmm. was just a process we went through because it's either a threat or an ally or something like that. And that is just adaptation to strange places. Most of the time, nothing came of it. Every once in a while, you'd say, okay, i got to deal with this guy. Yeah. Bullies mm-hmm. or thugs or... Um, just whatever. So, so, you know, Bob and I would have our radars out and we'd talk about the people in, in the area. And so I had to say, watch out for that guy and things like that. So we were, we were a team that way. Mm. But you know, the person who controlled it mostly was the teacher in the class. So you ever walk up to someone and you look at them and you go, nope, not go messing with that guy. Yes. So this guy was Mr. Tang. Mr. Tang. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm walking up to, and these are all single floor classrooms. I walk up, he's putting the key in the lock. I not, not gone into the, in the classroom at all. I looked at him and I said, Oh shit. Mm-hmm. Because I just, just the whole, his whole aura was one of presence. Yes. It's not the guys who are screaming. No. Don't mess with me. I'll kill you, bro. It's the ones who just show up and you're like, Oh, okay. It's the calm ones. He was, he was very calm. Yeah. He was very disciplined. because he could handle it. <laughs> he was very, so he set the boundaries, you know, when I say this, I want you to do this. Everyone keep your feet under your, and so I would test him. And so I, you know. Well, Why? Because that's how I understood what my limits were. Oh, okay. It's like. Oh, I suppose kids do that. Kids do that. So I I'd have my foot out and he'd walk by and he'd stand, he'd step right on my foot and he goes, Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Was did I did I are you okay? I love Tang. Do I do we need do we need to send you to the hot to the nurse's office, you know, to get that looked at? He had your number. I'm terribly, terribly sorry. And 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 the rest of the class is just going. <laughs> yeah. Because he they basically you step out of line, he steps on you. And in the most kind and friendliest way, but it hurt. Yeah. And I went, hmm. I don't like that. Yeah. So he'd be in line and I'd, I'd, you know, be horsing around and he'd walk up and he'd go, time to get back in line. And he'd do one of these things, which is a, you know, a, basically a karate move. And he'd just touch me in the middle of the chest and it hurt. Yeah. And it was very quiet, very subtle. And I went, I love that guy. What about that made you love him? Because I'd found someone I couldn't challenge with my usual methods. So it made me think, well, how am I going? I still wanted to impress the guy anyway. I always liked to be first in class. That was our, that was our thing. And so the way I was going to impress him is scholastically. Mm. And so because every time I stepped out of line any other way, he would, I, it hurt well, either psychologically or something like that. He just, he was a masterful person at that. After the first couple of weeks, it's like, I love that guy. Mm. Because I found someone I couldn't challenge that way. And the next, so he became a model. The next person was about sixth grade. His name was Mr. Benson. 
And it was interesting. He was he taught um, science, hmm. so we're in the lab, and uh, we used to we used to kid him about being the inventor of the Benson burner instead of the Bunsen burner. Mm-hmm. He thought that he always thought that was hilarious, but he had a teaching style that says, "Look at this," and he'd show you something, and you go, "Wow!" And he really got me thinking about how the world works, and you know things like that, and. And how you can affect it. Mm-hmm. And I love that guy. So I had a guy who was a disciplinarian. I had a guy who was a scientist. And then um, even in Denver, I had a, a guy who was, t- who was teaching graphic uh, industrial arts. He was teaching us how to draft. And he was so picky. He was he had a very, very high standard. And I, it, for me, there was, again, nothing better than an A. Uh, and so, you know, you'd be, you'd be a millimeter over the line on the line, and he would circle that. And so it, I love those guys because they taught me focus and discipline. And if I did it right, a positive word from them wiped everything out. Yeah, it seems like, it seems like we really focus on a, a father uh, displaying the behavior, but... In reality, it's kind of almost like the it takes a village type attitude, you know, as long as there are strong male, because there's certain things that like, you know, grandma masterfully like did the best that she could. But there's certain things that you have to learn from other men. There's certain things that she can't teach you. Does that feel accurate to you? No, I think that's true. Um, There's sort of standards for behavior and stuff like that. she uh, grew up in the fifties, mm-hmm. and there was a um, there was a standard for how men treated women, um, and some of them are are uh, you know, cultural. Some of them are just the, the process of the time. So, for example, in her time frame, men always walked on the outside or towards the street. When they walked with with their uh, mother or their woman, and they said, "Well, why do they do that?" Well, it keeps them from getting. Uh, <laughs> so you die first. <laughs> so if you died first, or you're, 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 you were protecting, you're yeah. actually protecting them from splashing and stuff like that. Oh. Um, but that was considered the courteous way to be. Opening doors for women was not a sign of that they were weak. It was showing them respect and courtesy. I do that now. Right. And so, um, it's, and it was, it's so ingrained, it was so ingrained in us that that's, was proper behavior that we don't even think about it. So, um, you know, when I, I walk with your mom, it's, and I'm walking on the outside. I change positions. So I, 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 because I feel uncomfortable, uh, if I don't do that. Um, opening it's, doors. It's it, just, I don't even think about it. No. And, and I do that for, for anybody for which I'm with, because it's a way of showing courtesy. Yeah. And it's not looking down on them or anything like that. It's just, it's just what you do as a gentleman. Yeah. I guess like, I, I guess because I was raised by someone who has that attitude that I don't recognize that as something Extraordinary. Yeah. It's just the way that you behave. Yeah. And when I started doing um, relationship coaching and I was working with only women, like those were, I had 20 clients and they were all women. I would listen to the stories that they would tell me about what these Mm -hmm. men were doing. And I use men very loosely in this case. And I was just, I found myself having to really take myself out of it. And just listen to what was going on because it was so far beyond behavior that anybody would exhibit towards somebody else that I, I just like, I couldn't grasp it. So, so I think in today's terms, you know, a man opening a door for a woman, woman opening a door for a man. Uh, there was a period of time when that was, I was, I felt a little bit odd when that happened, when, when a woman opened the door for me. If I, in the, outside the family, I felt odd when I would get yelled at for doing it. <laughs> well, well there, there's that, but I think the, the, then, I, then I realized is that why should men be the only ones entitled to show courtesy? Okay. I can get behind that. Yeah. So, uh, so what do you do 
you say thank you, and you hold the next door for them. And usually, you're going through two. You get you you walk through, open the door for them. Balance, balance. So, um, but th- those those are physical uh, representations of of a more general uh, I- a relationship with the world around you. Mm-hmm. you know, one revolving courtesy, respect, honor, things like that. Um, and that was probably the thing that grandma was most, uh, formal on, you know, how to treat other people. Um, was she the one that taught you the concept of chivalry that you passed on to me? With a small C? Yeah, I think so. Uh, the whole Small C? Sure. So chivalry with a small C is the idea that you give something with no concept of return. So not transactional interaction. Not transactional. I, I like to say there are three people kinds of people in this world. There are those who see the problem and comment on it. Oh, look at that. That piece of paper needs to be picked up. There are the people who need permission. Oh, look at that. There's a piece of paper. Should I pick it up for you? And then there are people who just pick it up, throw it in the trash, and move on. Because it's the right thing to do yeah. in their in their perspective. Well, it's something that needs to be done, whether it's right or not. It is subjective. Subjective. But the point is that they see a, if they see a problem, they fix it. So what's big C? So big, big C is where you put all of the formal trappings, pomp and circumstance. So big C really has to do with the historical uh, definition of chivalry. And this means fighting. And and, uh, and that's really where the, some of the toxic masculinity stuff comes in because it's it's show. Chivalry with a small C is about execution. Chivalry with a big C is about show. It seems like big C chivalry really kind of get gets back towards transactional or having it not just be something that you're doing that's nice for either the world around you or the people around you. It's more so so that it's like it's what they maybe call virtue signaling. You're doing something nice so that other people notice you're doing something nice just instead of just doing something wonderful for somebody else. Well, yes, and I think it's another uh, example of that is you're doing something because – uh, it's expected of you, not because you want to. Mm, so it seems like little C is almost more impactful than big C. Oh, absolutely, mm. absolutely. Uh, if you if you do something for somebody and and pass on, go on to the, go on to your next thing, their life is enriched, but so is yours. Yeah, well, being of service is one of the most fulfilling. Yeah, that's, things. that's really the key here. Is yeah, that you're, you know, that, that being of service, however you do that. Uh, one way to be of service, and this is still something I try to do you know, when I'm you know, when I'm out in public, when I was at work, is I had this thing where I wanted to make someone laugh full out in a day. But you were conscious about this. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> this was, <laughs> you know. How I, have you dealt with not being funny, though? Well, you know, <laughs> funny is one of those things where it's all about timing. <laughs> you know, so I, what would happen is, is that I said, I want to be funny that I would look it up in a book uh-huh. and figure out what, what, what that meant. And then I'd pick a target and I'd track <laughs> them throughout the day and I'd wait for just the right moment. And then i trip them. I would like to be clear that I was the target multiple times in my life. And that's why I'm so bad at torturing people with that, with that jokes now, because I was, I was baptized by fire. By dad joke fire, by you. Well, I just wanted you to always be trackzant, uh, aware of the of the environment around you when things happen. So you understand <laughs> that not everything is as it seems mm-hmm. in a funny way. Yeah, but Sorry, I so so anyway, so the the point is, I I had a whole series. I think the a whole series of men that became my father figures. Mm-hmm. Each of them brought an element of. Of my character, one of them was my fencing coach, Art, mm. Sh- Art Schenken in University of Illinois, and he took me on the team at a recommendation of Kohler. Mm. And you know, I had, I had, I had just started defense in high school. You know, it was a case where I had to wait for him to take me home, at, and he was a fencing assistant fencing coach. And one day he said, "Hey, you look bored." He threw a foil at me. He said, "Take that guy on." What? You know, and I, I actually did pretty well. And he goes, that's not bad. There's a tournament in Thanksgiving I want you to go to. It's called Turkey Open. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I said, you're nuts. And so I had three weeks to get ready for it. And so I started joining fencing practice. Mm -hmm. Um, the thing, the thing that happened there was he took someone who was simply bored out of tears and is about ready to do something freaky and gave him a folk, gave me a focus. Mm -hmm. So I went to that tournament and there's something about doing some competition for real the first time, you know, your heart rates through the roof. You've never done this before. They say lay on is like, bang. Yeah. I was hooked. Yeah. I was hooked. So, so anyway, that's how I got started. But, um, but I, I, you know, I was a two year fencer from high school. It sucked. So, yeah. So, but I was also, uh, interested in electronics. So I was on the team, but I was the armor. So I took care of the equipment. I was the equipment manager as well. So, you know, um, but it gave you direction. It did. But but Shankin, like most coaches, was not teaching me to be just a better fencer. He really was about developing men. That's so important. Like that's, that's so important to have those figures. It is. It's like it's it's really important. But what, one of the things I noticed though is some of the people who want to be those figures haven't done the work themselves. So it's kind of it's 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 uh it's like kind of hard to follow them, but yeah. I, then I guess they don't get followed. I don't know. Like, would you have been able to really decipher? I mean, I guess at that point you've been able to pick out who's right, who's wrong. Well, I had people around me who were quite happy to tell me that. So Kohler was that way. Schenken was definitely that way. I remember one time I lost a bout and I threw my helmet down. And I saw he had this. He was a one of these classic German guys mm -hmm. you know and i saw his eyes flick over and he never liked to see that he walked over and he said pick that up mm. and he said you don't always don't disrespect the equipment you should know better because i repaired it he says now what are you thinking so i lost what did you heard this line what did you do that allowed you to lose mm, that accountability is and so, so, it, 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 so what he would say is that win or lose, any experience you have, when you come out of it, sit down and ask yourself, what did I do to allow that to happen, good or bad? Because you can't control the outcome. It's already an outcome. You can't control what other people did. You have no control over other people. You can only take the lessons from yourself, but that takes introspection, which is can be painful at times. I mean, you, I'll tell a story about you. I got out of a third relationship where it pretty much ended the mm. exact same way, and I call my dad, and this will give you guys an idea of of why I take accountability because his response was loving at first, and then a little punch in the arm. He was like, "So let me get this straight. You've had three different relationships, three different women." And you had the same result in every relationship. And I was like, uh-huh. And he goes, you know what that means? I go, no. He goes, you're the problem. And you were absolutely right. You were absolutely right. And it still took me going to therapy to understand to understand why I was choosing those people. Yeah. But I can't stop them from being that way. I can only control whether I entertain them or not, people are going to be who they are. I don't have control over that. But through learning to love myself a bit more, and I have, I had very much that same ooh, challenge mentality. That's why I dated women who were so mean to me, because I looked at it, I was like, ooh, I'm going to show her that I can handle her. But then I'm, then I inherited mother's sensitivity. So yeah. they would eat me up, eat me up. But that, I chose them repeatedly. So I, I, my observation there is that you were choosing to ride the tiger. Yes. So you can't get off. And if you do, they turn around and bite your ass. Yeah, I'm holier so, than the church with how so, many bites. So anyway, so the, the point is, is that I had a lot of, I was lucky. I had a lot of really good male figures who challenged me. And then I had one really strong female figure. Grandma. No, not. Oh, mom. Yeah. Yeah. So 
I knew her in high school and, and I was a valedictorian there and I had, you know, I was big cheese in many ways. Uh, we met much earlier than that. And I dated her girlfriend. Uh, in her. You player. <laughs> yeah. I've dated four people in my life. So you so much. player. Yeah, me too. Anyway. So, <laughs> and, um, so when we decided, we, we started dating in college and, and there's a whole story behind that. But when we decided we wanted to go further, she wasn't so sure. Her father basically hated me, probably for the right reasons, um, which was I had no real um, – uh, I was I was still pretty much independent, a wild guy and stuff like that, and I didn't respect him in that mm. regard, and he was scary. So – but when we finally started, started talking about going further in our relationship, we used to sit on our porch, and we would have our – um, uh, discussions of woe is what I used to call them mm. because she would she set her boundaries very clearly <laughs> she still does <laughs> she still does and and we and we discussed what that was and some of their bound, her boundaries had to do about differences in her energy um, yeah, my, my approach to the world was pretty much like the Tasmanian devil I was spinning 91 ways. I love being really busy. You know, even in college, I was going to, I was taking a full engineering load. I was fencing 20 hours uh, a week. On week, weekends, I'd lose the weekends. I was working because I was putting myself through school, except I had everything except my food and shelter mm -hmm. as grants. And, and I loved it. It was, you know, and she was the other other kind of energy. Her energy was much slower and calmer and stuff like that. And she says, you know, we got to figure that part out because I can't keep up with you and you will get bored if you try to stay with me. And I said, and the, the meme we used was, okay, here's what we'll do. I'll go out, do my thing. I'll run around in circles while you're moving along. Mm -hmm. And when, you, when it's time to talk, stick your foot out and trip me. And that works. It does. Hmm. So part of, so part of it was is that there was times when I needed to go off and just you know let loose and go, whatever it was. Usually it was on a project or something like that. We were very single minded on those sorts of things. But every once in a while, she'd either literally or figuratively put her foot out, and we would sit down and talk about what she wanted to talk about or do what she wanted to do. Now, with over 40 years or 44 now, uh, we've gotten to the point where it's kind of hard to understand that when those thing, events happen. But in the early 10, 15 years of marriage, um, you know, there were times when I felt like she was a kite. I was kind of towing her. Uh, and so it, it took a while for me to sort of condition. And this, again, sort of courtesy is that when I'm around her, I slow down. When I'm by myself, I speed up. Pretty much so. what what made you feel that that compromise was worth it because you it is a compromise you had to change not change aspects of who you are but maybe adjust aspects of who you are what made that was that hard was that easy what made you decide that you wanted to do that it was hard because it was a it was a fundamental change of behavior in some respects Mm -hmm. And I was used to just basically accountable to myself. Yeah. At least at that age. And, but I discovered, I discovered that I loved her and I wanted to be with her. And that was the only way I was going to do that. But I also knew who I was because I had the ground into me. Um, so we had to come up with, you know, what is it we like about each other and what is it we don't like about each other? Mm -hmm. Uh, and I don't mean like in the sense of, you know, you know, I hate you. It's just that, you know, there, there are some things that I do that makes her nuts. And there's some things that she does that makes me nuts. And I have basically decided that I don't care about those things. Hmm. And it's a conscious decision. It's like, you know, when that happens, I kind of go, well, okay, next. Mm -hmm. um, because it's the rest of it that I want. So that's true in any any relationship is that, you know, you know, you may not like someone eating with their mouth open. I know that's true for you. Oh, it drives me nuts. <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize it had a name either. 
No, it does. Misophonia. It's an actual thing. It makes me violently angry out of nowhere. I can't control it. So I just either plug my ears or remove myself because I'm not going to freak out about it because it's just someone chewing. For a minute there, I thought you were doing a Jar Bar Binks. Uh, uh, jar Bar? Jar Jar? Jar Jar Binks. Uh, Come sorry. on, you're the nerd here. Yeah, Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> Misophonia. <laughs> oh my God. Get out. All right, this is over. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so um, that that really was... We, we we probably spent a year and a half. God, that's a lot of time to do that. It's what I'm, well, the reason I'm reacting that way is because in today's society, dating moves so much faster and there are so many more what people perceive as options out there. So it's just like, I don't really see a whole lot of what you're describing anymore. Someone who is willing to put in that kind of work. Because in their mind, well, if this doesn't fit what I want, I just move on to the next one. And they will say it to your face that, okay. But honestly, if that's the attitude that somebody has, I'm grateful for them letting me know that that's how they view in the dating world. But it's just, it's so much different now. Yeah, I, th I think so. Part of it is there is an expectation that developing relationships is like like putting together some kind of puzzle or a car or it's like this checklist right and the reality is is that a relationship is a whole series of of interactions and you're constantly judging how you feel about that based on the interactions some of our social some of our emotional so like that and you actually have to go through a a number of those kinds of experiences, good times, bad times. I, I think, I think a, a good argument is, a, is, is important because mm. if you're, if you uh, are both wanting to come to closure on it, and that's really the key, then it's in, in that discussion that you discover what the other person's about. And, you know, there's a, there's a saying, never go to bed mad. So I think that the idea there is, you know, all arguments end by 8 p.m. But come on, Dad. You can make that happen. No. You can. Uh, if the argument's big enough, and but both people have to be willing, though. That's the it doesn't issue. mean the discussion's over. The argument has to end. You have uh, to take the temperature down. Uh, so what you say is, okay, I understand we're not, we haven't gotten, gotten to closure on this. Let's stop now. We'll put on. We'll go watch TV or do something that we'd like to do, or just go get apart from so each other. De-escalation. De-escalation, and then we'll t we'll take it up next time. We come and go. Where were we? And most of the time, we can't remember exactly where we were. So you kind of start at a much lower level. So there is a, you know, if you kind of make it, uh, and this is this is not nothing new. Is never go to bed mad. It's almost biblical. Well, I think I think a, a, also you have to be willing to focus on the we instead of the me in the discussion. Mm -hmm. If people, what I found was people who are in unhealthy relationships um, and when they would get into the issues within the relationship, they were trying to prove themselves right instead of come to an understanding. And so I think, I think if someone, I mean, you tell me, I think if someone finds themselves whenever they are getting into a discussion that they're, side of the discussion gets squashed and dismissed that's probably just not someone that you should be with because I, I don't know that sounds like a lack of respect for that person and you can't really have a relationship without respect right yeah i think if that happens from time to time okay if it if it's a, if the all it happens all the time then i think you're right yeah so now i'm really starting to grasp why i don't like I'm very much like mom in a lot of ways, but a lot of the toxic masculine ideas like of what it takes to be a man or what I need to be in order to be considered masculine, I've just never adhered to. Like, I mean, yeah, I have aspects of me that, that apply to that, but I've never looked at it as there's this set of rules and I have to be this to be a man. Like that's silly to me because to me, I also don't associate masculine and feminine with gender. I think that men can exhibit a lot more masculine behaviors, but so can women. I think it's a, it's an energy. It's not a gender. Yeah. I, I, I always hate to call it a gender. It is, it is a behavior. Yeah. Um, and 
you know, some uh, behaviors are more appropriate in a home setting or with children or in the, in the environments that females find themselves in, and some are more appropriate in other environments. So generally, you have to be more assertive and things like that in, say, corporate environments or, you know, uh, yeah. competitive environments, things where things are competitive because those are the traits that succeed. But at home, you don't need to do that. And so I, I always like the meme of the guy who who looks like a biker but can change a diaper i mean like if you're a, if you've got this like oh i'm a biker image and you get taken down by a poopy diaper are you really that tough or are you just showing out for people yeah that that's one way to look at it but the point is is that the your persona max masculinian masculinity is really about uh, a persona you put on according to what environment that you're in. If you are in a combat zone, you want to be a toxic masculine person where you want to take out everyone in front of you. But that same person needs to come home and be able to be caring and loving and stuff like that. And it is a it is a a personality that you need to culture culture when you're in that environment. So, God, say I was a, I was a kid. Uh, and you were going to give me guidance with the perspective that you have now on what it means to be masculine or be a man. What guidance would you give childhood me? Well, I think the first one is to be good to your word. Hmm. And when you say you're going to do something, do it to the best of your ability. Because for me, that's... I don't know if that's a masculine thing or not, but mm -hmm. it is it is sort of the table stakes. Secondly, is understand that you have a variety of roles to play. Some of them are more male dominant, some are not. And and to do those those roles well. If you're going to be a father, be a father. If you're going to uh, do things that are uh in masculine in nature, just do them well. Um but the other part is to realize is that everyone is different around you, that that there are times when tenderness is absolutely required. In fact, you should start there and escalate only if, escalate only if you have to, that understanding and compassion are stronger tools than, uh, you know, pressure and fear and stuff like that. You'll get much, you know, much further along that way. Um, golden rule applies. So for for me, being masculine means using the right persona or tool for the context and understanding what that is. It's not one size fits all. It means uh, doing the parts where the masculine side of you uh, fit. And if you're stronger, use that strength that way, you know, uh, but do that for the benefit of others. Um, and, it, and if time warrants it, then, you know, kick ass, but only if it warrants it. So you want to be that calm person that, that everyone respects because they know you can take care of business, but then be the compassionate person around the people around it, around you. I think the other, other part is generosity. If you have uh, enough if you are enough, you can be generous with yourself. And I think that's where people hold things to themselves because they fear that giving it away somehow diminishes them. Scarcity. Scarcity. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of scarcity in my younger life, and I still hang on to things longer than I probably should. But... The one thing that you have is your time and your compassion. And that's, that's as limitless as you want it to be. Mm. Be generous. So uh, before, before, I can't really send them to your social media as I usually do at this point because you, while you have it, it's not something that you are active on. So instead, I, I want to say that I am, it is never lost on me how lucky I am to be raised the way that I was in the environment that I was um, allowed to be who I am, even if it didn't make sense to you at times. 
I have an audience with a lot of people who didn't have that system. And I have borne witness to like how damaging that can be. So I know that throughout my life, you've talked about how proud of me that you are. But I want to say as an adult, now that I can look at you, how proud of you I am and how grateful I am to the world that you provided for me. Because you, while you did have grandma and you had male figures throughout the course of time, you didn't have the same safety and consistency that I've had in my life. And I'm just really grateful that regardless of where you came from, because a lot of people pass that on and don't take time to look at it. The fact that you made a choice to do it different, to do it in a way that made sense for now, instead of just going through what you have gone through, I'm immensely grateful for that. It's made my life I, yeah, it's, I, I wouldn't be where I am right now if I hadn't had that sort of environment to be in, regardless of who caused it. I am proud of you because you are who I mirror. I think people will see that throughout the course of this, this interview that how similar we are. Um, so I mirrored you and I turned into a good man, which means you're a good man. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you want to have a hug? Okay. <laughs> Stay there. I know. Don't move. <laughs> all right i love you i love you too okay i was waiting for you to say it back i was gonna get really angry uh oh <laughs> <laughs> let's go eat food okay